We now have come to the part about the Tathagata. The Tathagata uh, means the Buddha. As many of you know, the, the word Buddha means awakened one. Awakener, the one who is awakened. And as you see here in the text, the Tathagata, a worthy one, rightly self-awakened, that term awakened is Buddho in the Pali. Uh, so in that case, uh, it's not a term for a Buddha. It's a description of Buddhahood. Tathagata is composed of two words, tata and some other word, which could be one or both of two possibilities. One is the word agata, which means come, having come, and gata, which means gone. But when you put the two words together, there are certain rules, we call Santi rules, by a person I believe named Santi, who described them, although, no, no, Panini came up with them. I don't know why he called them Santi rules. Santi, maybe San means together and D means put. Maybe just the rules of how you have to put things together. In any case, <coughs> Panini gave us the Santi rules, which tell us that when you put tata together with agata, make it into one word by combining the a and the a, uh, and when those come together, it turns into the sound a. Uh. So a uh plus a uh equals a. Uh. On the other side, if you put tata gata together by putting tata together with gata, well, you still have the sound a. Ah. So to say thus come one would be tata gata, and to say thus gone one is pronounced tata gata, which is exactly the same. And so no one knows if the Buddha meant which of those he meant, or maybe he meant both. However, we don't even know what he meant, because he apparently just picked up this word from previous traditions. He doesn't seem to be the person who came up with it. Not always the case. He came up with a lot of his own material, but it seems that he was willing to simply take this phrase from other traditions. And so even uh, prior to him, this decision was made, and we don't know exactly what it means. In any case, the point is whether it's thus come or thus gone, it's that things just as they are, that this individual is, is either gone, meaning has passed away, has transcended, due to a perfect awareness of how things really are, thus, or has come in accordance with the way things are, meaning come to teach us, come to lead, come to guide, in accordance with the way things are. Both epithets are beautiful. Uh, <clears throat> and this is one of the ten epithets of the Buddha. You see another one here, a worthy one. This is the Arahant. So, a uh, worthy one, that's what that means. And in this way, we see that the Buddha and the, his, the other people who are fully enlightened, in a certain way, are the same. A Buddha is just a special kind of Arahant. That's all. It's a special kind. Well, what kind? We get to find out here. Two of the differences. So, this Tathagata, that's the word that the Buddha used when, when referring to himself and other Buddhas, directly knows 
earth as earth. So in this way, it's just the same as what we've seen before, even a sekka, even us. Same for us, as they say in Zen. When a crow calls and we hear it, it sounds like this, caw, caw. <laughs> and when a crow calls and a Buddha hears it, it sounds like this, caw, caw. <laughs> just like that, there's no difference. Well, then what is the difference then? Isn't it the case that for a Buddha, crows say something else? <laughs> no, that's not the case. If you compare a Buddha to a person who isn't working on this training and hasn't gotten to the point of mindfulness so that it's possible to directly experience things, well then, when a crow calls and a normal person hears it, it sounds something like this. Because they don't hear it, not present. But once you start training, then you can hear, oh, crows say caw caw. That is what it sounds like. Interesting. Start actually noticing things. Oh, interesting. For a Buddha, same sound. Sees the earth. Ah, earth. So then what is the difference? Well, directly knowing earth from earth, directly knowing earth from earth, directly knowing earth, he does not conceive about earth. And as I say, the word things is here, but things is added in, there's no things in the original. It means things, it also means ourselves. But I think it's a little bit nicer to just leave it the way it was originally written, even though it doesn't make sense in English. It's grammatically incorrect along with being somewhat uh, oblique. But it's intentionally oblique, so let's just face, let's deal with the grammatical confusion, the grammatical awkwardness. for the sake of retaining the obscurity. Because a great deal is being said here, so it needs to be vague enough to hold all of that. He does not conceive about earth, does not conceive in earth, does not conceive from earth, does not conceive earth as mine, does not conceive my earth, and does not delight in earth. Why is that? Because the Tathagata has comprehended it to the end comprehended it to the end, has totally comprehended it. So, <clears throat> how does that happen? Well, we've been over this enough. This total comprehension doesn't happen by theorizing about it more and more. At one point, as we all know, there are a lot of theories, people have a lot of theories, and people have had a lot of theories, and someone went to the Buddha once and asked him, what is your theory of reality? You know, people have lots of theories of reality. Well, I think God created the world. Well, I don't think God created the world. I don't think there is God. Well, I think that it's a big bang. I think that the uh, universe cycles, big bang, big crunch. Well, I don't think so. I think big bang and then big freeze. These are real terms for information. And big rip, whatever it is. People have lots of ideas. So someone went up to him and said, what's your theory of reality? What's your theory of the cosmos? And the Buddha's response was so, so calm and confident. He said, I am awake, therefore I have no theories. There it is. He does not conceive about earth, does not conceive in earth, does not conceive from earth, does not conceive earth as mine, does not delight in earth. Why is that? Because the Tathagata has comprehended it to the end. Does it happen through theorizing? No. Does it happen through making it mine, possessing it, grasping it, clinging to it? No. 
Does it happen through cherishing it, protecting it, delighting in it, obsessing about it? No. It happens through cutting off all of that and having a direct experience, staying with that direct experience to the end, to the absolute end. What is this end? What does that mean? It means that everything we're clinging to has been abandoned to stay with that. And we can feel ourselves as we do that, as the other group has been dealing with, can feel ourselves dying. And it can sometimes feel frightening. We feel like we're being lost or forgotten, even destroyed. Why? Well, because all the things we've been clinging to, identifying with, we ourselves are forgetting them, losing them. And that we discover they naturally are destroyed. That which comes into being passes away. That which is born dies. And we're allowing that to happen. We see it happening. And it can be frightening. And yet, at a certain point, we have to ask, is that which comes and goes me? This self-centered nature, this ego, it conceives and it delights. It conceives and delights. And yet, if we observe that conceiving, we stay with it. Soon enough we notice it goes away. It comes and it goes. All this conceiving arises and passes away. We can observe it and watch that happening. Conceiving comes up. I think the universe is infinite. Meh, maybe not. <laughs> I think it's finite. Or not. <laughs> or the sense of self. I think I'm doing really well right now. No, I'm not. <laughs> I think I'm doing great right now. No, I'm not. <laughs> I think I'm falling apart right now. Hmm, no, I'm not. <laughs> Or <clears throat> cherishing, clinging. I really want this thing. Like, maybe we really want lunch. I want lunch so much. Then we eat it. And we don't want it anymore. <laughs> I wanted it. No, I don't. <laughs> maybe, maybe we really wanted to come to this retreat. But not anymore. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe we want to leave the retreat, but then we don't, and we're so glad we didn't. Who knows what it is? In any case, all of these conceptions, desires, opinions, preferences come and go, come and go, come and go. And we feel as we watch all that happening like, I am being destroyed. But if we watch closely, we realize, how could it be that that which I'm watching coming and going could be me. That which I can observe arising and passing away can't be me. That can't be me that's being born and is dying. So this self-centered nature that's doing all that isn't me. Well then, what is me? What is this me?
We <clears throat> typically consider ourselves to be some mystical entity, essence, that somehow is connected to thoughts and emotions. Maybe our physical body also. Maybe I'm my physical body, but mm, doesn't seem quite right. Because if I'm this body, let's say I lost a limb, had an accident, lost a leg. Would I disappear? Nah, not really. Hmm. So I'm not in my leg or my arm. Okay, well then, hmm. What if I had a brain injury? Would I be gone? Nah, not really. So maybe I'm these emotions, but these emotions come and go. So I can't really be them either. But all the thoughts, not really. They come and go even faster than the emotions. Huh. Where am I in all of this? The person who we typically think we are, when we say, you know, this person totally changed, often what we mean is their personality. Often we're referring to their personality, the person who conceives and delights here and there. So we're talking about maybe a personality? Well, <clears throat> first of all, I, one of the most important things in setting me on this path, something which I'm afraid I, I can't explain to you. I always wish I could explain this to people and I can't. I explain it to people, and then I look at everyone's faces, and I can see that no one understands. Um, I bet a lot of you have this kind of experience sometimes. You have something that's very important to you, something you've experienced that really matters, that's impacted your life, and you would like to tell people about it, and then they say, yeah, right. <laughs> I see what you mean. So you know what it's like. It's hard to share these things, especially if other people haven't had the experience. But I'll try again. Uh, if there were a way to get this across, it would be very helpful, but I don't know what it is. So <clears throat> I, as many of you know, have uh, food sensitivities, call them allergies some kind of allergy. And they impact me physically in a certain way, but they also impact me emotionally, mentally. Uh, and that means that again and again in my life, I've experienced my personality changing quickly for no reason. Emotions will arise suddenly for no reason. Thoughts will arise for no reason. <clears throat> my level of energy will change for no reason. Or parts of my personality will disappear for no reason. Emotions will disappear for no reason. Thoughts will disappear for no reason. Well, what is the reason? Because there's always a reason. There actually is a reason. The reason is I ate something or I inhaled something, a perfume, or peanuts, something like that. And suddenly, as people will say, it's like he's a different person. That's a fascinating sentence, isn't it? Suddenly as if I'm a different person. That gives us a clue into what people think people are. We're personality, emotion, intelligence. That's what people are. Because if that changes and you're a different person, well, then that's what a person is. So people have the sense, I'm a different person. I have the sense, I'm a different person. But there's an issue. There's a little catch here, which is the part that's so hard for people to understand. 
Even Autumn has seen some of this. Some of you have seen a little bit of it, but she's seen a little more. Even then, it's hard to understand that the person who is incompetent and stupid and angry and frustrated is me. Just as much as this one. This is a totally valid me, and so is that. It's not that this is the real me. The anger that arises is real anger. My worldview is really my worldview. It's not that that me isn't the real me, it's just the one that's happening because of the peanut butter, or the whatever, whatever it would be, the cologne or whatever it would be. It's not that that one is the fake one, because it's caused by this substance. But this other one is the real one. There's nothing more real about either one. Both are just created by causes and conditions. You can say, yeah, but that's this cause. Okay, but here I am. This me is also caused by all kinds of stuff including a certain layout of chemicals in my body, in my head. Am I a balance of chemicals? Is that me? If you change that balance, am I gone and a fake one emerges? <laughs> for a short time until a different balance is restored, which is the real me. The thing that I've had to face <clears throat> is that that me is me, if this one is, until ultimately needing to face that that me isn't me, but it's equally me as this one. So this me isn't me. And put very bluntly, it means that when I'm angry from eating something, and I'm angry because somebody does something, I can absolutely confirm that the anger from eating the peanut butter, I can logically confirm that that anger is meaningless. Absolutely meaningless. And it is precisely as valid as the other anger. It's the same anger. It's not a different anger. It's anger. And this is anger. And what happens if you, if you have to go through this hundreds of times is that the whole thing, the whole thing starts looking meaningless until we have to really ask is there anything else? So often we think, you know, this is what I want. Here's, here's the way it's going to work. I'm going to get enlightened. And then I will always be happy <laughs> and right. <laughs> That's the deal. I will get enlightened. And the definition of enlightenment is that you are invariably happy and right. <laughs> that's how it works, isn't it? Hmm? I mean, that's how it should work. Without noticing, wait, happy is a conditioned state. Identification with a conditioned state is not enlightenment. It's delusion. Wait, being right, a certain view, that's a conditioned state. It comes and goes, 
Identification with a conditioned state is not enlightenment, it's delusion. And identification anywhere is selfishness, not liberation. This sense of personality <coughs> isn't being approached appropriately. And in fact, if you look at this person, this Tathagata, if you really get to know this individual, there are two things that you notice about him. One is, he's definitely a real person. The more you read this, and the, when you can get out of the immediate confusion regarding why it's worded in the way it is, it's also incomprehensible and uh, it's stilted. You're, you get past it. It's easy. Okay, it was pa transmitted orally for a while, so it's kind of stilted. Okay, it's kind of incomprehensible. That's just because you don't know the technical terms. It's not any more comprehensible than any conversation we have in the modern world about anything, technology or travel or science, whatever it's going to be. It's not particularly incomprehensible, and it's not even particularly stilted. It's kind of beautiful. So once you get over all that, and you can get into what's really happening, and get to know these people, you realize, wow, this, is a, this person was a person. It, it, you start to realize this is a person. It isn't the same as mythology or something, which I also very much love. But myths, the mythical figures aren't like this. This is different. Okay, it's a real person, but what else? He's a real person. The Buddha's a real person, and the Buddha doesn't really have a personality. It's interesting. The other people in the texts, Venerable Shariputta, one of his main disciples who often lectured, Venerable Upalawanna, one of his main female disciples who often, often who lectured, Venerable Damadina, who was the primary lecturer of the nuns, the magnificent Venerable Ananda, who we all love to death, love him so much, he was so magnificent, love him. They all have personalities, and yet this one doesn't really have a personality, and that's interesting. So what does that say about our personalities? Does that mean that we shouldn't have a personality? And we've seen that personality is a fabricated thing without much meaning in it. That isn't the way to see it. <clears throat> On the contrary, each of these conditioned states that comes and goes, every part of our personality, our intelligence, our history, our perspectives, our opinions, our preferences, our interests, our emotional patterns, all of those are tools. And all of those tools can be used for the benefit of the world. Here I am right now. The experience of getting angry because of eating something. Using it as a tool. Using that experience as a tool to be of benefit. With the utilization of a different tool, this, this personality, this conditioned state. Which is still a conditioned state. But it's being used, and the other tool is being used, in order to be of service. That's the significance of personality. We use our personalities. Doesn't mean we identify with them, but we use them. And as we get better and better at using them, we actually become more and more expressive of our personality. And so it's strange that when you meet people who are advanced on this path, they have transcended themselves, transcended their emotions, which you can confirm. And yet those very same people fully experience their emotions, deeply expressive of their views, 
not to talk about myself too much, but look, do I fail to express my perspectives? What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> do I have some vacuous or repressed personality? That's what someone thought about me recently. <laughs> she hadn't met me. She just heard from one of my friends that I was Buddhist. And she said, oh, right. So I suppose he represses his emotions a lot. <laughs> now, first of all, no. <laughs> Second of all, no. Because she said, oh, he said he's really Buddhist. Well, first of all, if you're really Buddhist, you're not really Buddhist. <laughs> That's the first thing. But the second thing is being really Buddhist doesn't mean <clears throat> that you repress, ignore, or uh, attack your emotions. <laughs> On the contrary, you discover how to experience them fully. You discover how to express your personality fully, and that act of full experience and freedom from imprisonment within the experience, identification with the experience, turn out to be the same thing. Why? Because either way, it's clinging. You're either repressing through clinging or you're identifying through clinging. And that's exactly what we let go of in order to experience freedom. With that freedom comes an expressive, yet diaphanous, light, malleable, unfixated, unobstruct unobstructing personality. A useful tool, not a burdensome hindrance. Okay, so how do we work with this personality, if it, this ego, if it starts feeling like a, like a hindrance, or it's feeling problematic? How do we deal with that? We see, we come to see that ego, yes, it's a kind of a hindrance. That's true. But what does it hinder? Let's say that it's hindering. What is it hindering? Let's say it's obstructing. What's it obstructing? It's obstructing experience. It's obstructing our experience. What else could it obstruct? Here we are having an experience, an ego gets involved, and everything starts feeling obstructed. But what is this everything that's feeling obstructed? <clears throat> it's experience. Okay. What's it obstructing experience with? What do you get when your experience is obstructed? Experience. That's what. So ego obstruct experience with experience, which is to say that ego fails. Ego is not capable of obstructing experience. We attempt to obstruct our experience. This is a, <coughs> this is Here's a metaphor given that I often give is that there's a tennis player from old times named Billie Jean King. Some of you may have heard of her. She's quite famous. And <clears throat> she was an excellent tennis player, best in the world for, for a short time. And <clears throat> <clears throat> she now teaches tennis sometimes, talks about tennis. And one of the things that she said about tennis, which I thought was very helpful, is... The problem that most people have in tennis 
For most people, the basic problem is that they're afraid to hit the ball. Which is true. Most tennis players are afraid to hit the ball. Hitting the ball is scary. But, she said, if you're a tennis player who's afraid to hit the ball, you have a problem. You have a real problem. You have a problem that's bigger than any of your other problems. You can say, well, my footwork isn't very good. Okay, you have a bigger problem. My backhand isn't very good. Okay, you have a bigger problem. I mean, even, oh, I don't have a tennis racket. Okay, you have a bigger problem. <laughs> if you're afraid to hit the ball, that's a big problem. In the same way, most of us are afraid to have an experience. We resist having an experience. We're afraid of this experience. We don't really want to experience it. We don't know if we can handle it. We don't know if we're going to do a good job at it. But there's a difference here. That is, that if you're afraid to hit the ball in tennis, you have some options. Well, don't buy a tennis racket. Even if you have one, don't go to the tennis court. But you can't avoid experience. There's no place to sit next to the court and watch other people play. You, we are here. You're not falling out of the universe. You're here having an experience. And so even if you're afraid of having an experience, you're just having the experience of being afraid of having an experience. And so I'd ask you, are you afraid of that? Are you afraid? to be afraid of having an experience? Maybe you say, well, yeah, I am. Okay. Are you afraid of that? Are you afraid to be afraid? To be afraid of having an experience? And the thing to see, the thing to see, if you're reading this text and you want to really understand it, is that the answer changes at first when you're afraid of the experience the fear feels relieving until you realize that the fear is itself an experience that you need to be afraid of <laughs> so you back up into safety which is your fear okay well i'm afraid of being afraid that's good but wait oh no this is also an experience that I need to avoid. We're having an experience in our bodies. What do we do to, to deal with this difficult experience? We tighten up. We resist it. But notice, at that moment of tightening up, yes, you tightened up, you resisted, but wait, you had equanimity with resisting, didn't you? You were okay with resisting this experience. You had equanimity with the resistance. So we can say, good news, you have equanimity. But we say, no, I don't. I shouldn't be resisting. I need to resist resisting. So I'd say, okay, resist resisting. Why? Because you apparently have equanimity with resisting resisting. <laughs> resisting resisting seems to be something you have good equanimity with. So do that and practice equanimity with the experience of resisting resistance. You say, no. Resisting resistance would never work. I should resist resisting resistance. 
And I'd say, great, good news. You sound like you have really good equanimity with resisting, resisting, resistance. Go for it. No, that would never work. Without noticing that we ourselves, as we go through this process, very quickly, first moment, we feel safe in the resistance. There actually is equanimity. But then the moment that we conceive something about it, the tightening up happens. But that very tightening up itself feels relieving. If we can stay with that moment and not conceive, not make it into mind, not cling to the way things should be, if we can stay in that moment, then whatever is happening is still an experience that's happening. We can catch ourselves. It's the opposite though we would usually try to do this path. With this path, we usually attempt to make ourselves practice correctly. But this way, it's the opposite. We're catching ourselves practicing correctly every moment. We're able to stay with the correct practice, this direct knowing prior to conceiving, prior to mind-making, prior to this cherishing, delighting, clinging, grasping, prior to all that, there's already an experience that's prior to all that. And we can stay with it. And even if you say, no, I can't, it's not true. Because this experience is still that. You're going to say, no, I'm conceiving. Okay, you're conceiving. But conceiving is just, as it says here, a cognition. This person can experience the cognized as the cognized. You're conceiving, fine, that's a cognition. You're comprehending. Do it. Have that experience fully. In just the same way, we can say, I shouldn't have this personality. Well, okay, but the person who thinks you shouldn't have that personality, that's just your current personality. <laughs> Have that personality if you want it. Go for it. You say, but I don't want to have that personality. <laughs> Good. You got a new one. Have that personality. Again and again, we attempt to fight without noticing that there was never anyone to fight against. And furthermore, we didn't even find the person who started the fight. I, fighting can't even be found. The me who fights can't even be found, much less whoever I'm fighting with. This experience just keeps on rolling. That's why this text gives us this long sequence, because it's talking about experience after experience. You can say, oh, why is it so cumbersome? But actually, it's giving you experience after experience after experience, noticing these are all different kinds of experiences. And all of them, it, all, it keeps on applying. So that whatever we experience, it keeps on working. The basic method just keeps on being appropriate, useful, true. So there isn't a need to fight against our personality, to destroy our personality. Nor is there a need to delight in our personality, to identify with our personality. So this isn't about changing something. On the contrary, it's about setting aside the subtle act of appearing to be in conflict. How is that actually done? This text has been saying it countless times. How many times has it said it? Said it hundreds of times now, although you see the ellipses, we're skipping a lot of the repetitions, but hundreds of times this answer has been given. It's given to us so clearly. It couldn't be given clearer. This is how they, in Zen, they say, it's as if the mother cut 
the small piece of fruit and skinned it and made it into a perfect bite-sized piece and put it onto our lips. <laughs> she did everything she could do for us. Just eat it. <laughs> In the same way, we come to this final magnificent passage. The Tathagata, an arahant, a samma sambuddho, was correctly awakened, not dependent on anyone else, directly knows earth as earth, directly knowing earth as earth. He does not conceive about earth, does not conceive in, from earth, does not conceive earth as mine, does not delight in earth, and here we are. Finally, we have arrived where it all began. Does not delight in earth. Why? Because he has known, he has realized that delight is the root of suffering. That clinging, craving, attachment, accumulation, resistance is the source of suffering. And now here it is. If you're afraid of death, here's the solution. That from coming into being, there is birth, and that for what has come into being, there is aging and death. If you don't want to die, don't be born. If you don't want to be born, don't become. And that act of becoming can be cut off, can be ended, can be abandoned. The craving that causes suffering can be abandoned, can be ended. Yes, if I come into being, that me must die. But if I don't come into being, and there's no one even to be born, much less die. We may be concerned it wouldn't work. How would I do things? Okay, how does this storm do things? Does the storm, because the storm doesn't know here I am, does it fail? <laughs> Isn't there a wonder in this world? This, to me, is the great danger, the true danger of modern, this modern dominant religion called secular humanism, materialism. Because it concluded and held to it what I concluded and then got over when I was a teenager. When I was going through all that and I realized, oh, all of my experience is just chemicals. It's just chemicals. If I'm happy, it's chemicals. If I'm sad, it's chemicals. There's no meaning in any of it. That I could clearly see. Okay. There's truth in that. There's a truth to be found in that. The question is, do we stop there? We stop there. It's a sad world. And there's no reason not to destroy it. No reason at all. If there's just chemicals, it doesn't really matter what structure they're in. So who cares? But is that conceiving really something we're going to base our lives on? We're going to base the future of this planet on? That's just a conceiving that we have clung to. Because of that clinging, we, as we are, have come into being as we are. It's time for us to die. It's time for this me, this us, who has come into being to die.
Why? Because this was never us. This just naturally dies. Just like this storm. It's going to end. And this sense of things, this belief, this conceiving, is passing right now. It's dissolving. If we cling to it, we suffer. If we identify with it, then we have the experience of dying. This final sentence is said with extraordinary compassion. This isn't just about somebody who got enlightened. This is about how we save the world. Therefore, with the total ending, fading away, cessation, abandoning, and relinquishment of craving, the Tathagata has totally awakened to the unexcelled, correct awakening, independent awakening. And you see at the end, this is even applied to nirvana. We have the ability to break free of the delusions, of the self-centered desires, of the patterns, that cause suffering in this world. We here have the opportunity to actually live that out because we have the tools and we have the support needed. Let us commit that we will not waste the short time we have left in this awakening period, this last day. We will not waste it, but on the contrary, for the benefit of all beings, we will transcend through direct knowledge our thoughts, our self-centeredness, and our attachments, our selfish desires. This is the opportunity we have. And by rising to it, by accepting it, we accept our relationship with and love for all living things. <laughs>